Without further ado, we're going to jump right into our main keynote uh, of the day. Uh, so to proceed with that, I would like to invite up um, from our sponsor for this keynote, the Aerospace Corporation. Thank you very much to uh, sponsoring this segment of the day. Uh, I would like to welcome up Jim Myers, Senior Vice President from the Aerospace Corporation. Jim. All right, thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jim Myers, Senior VP at the Aerospace Corp. Honor to introduce today's luncheon keynote speaker. <clears throat> uh, it's been quite an invigorating first day of the 2023 Von Braun Symposium, so a, a fitting end to the day. We've heard from many of you today just how close we are to breakthroughs that will help humanity achieve a new and exciting future, spacefaring future. This is quite an awe-inspiring prospect. Humans living and working on the moon, exploration missions to Mars and beyond, these are within reach in the lifetimes of, well, some people here. Um, these achievements will inspire people across the world and uh, the work you all are doing is gonna lead us there. At Aerospace, we, are, we believe that we're living in the most exciting time in space. Our customers, our partners, the imperatives calling us and the world to space and the impact that these missions and the success of these missions will have on the future of humanity. Our keynote speaker this afternoon is presiding over much of the activity generating this achievement. Bill Nelson has dedicated most of his life to public service <clears throat> in the national interest. He attained the rank of captain after serving for six years in the U.S. Army and U.S. Army Reserves. He represented the people of Florida with distinction in numerous public roles over four decades, including 12 years as their U.S. congressman, 18 years U.S. Senator. Throughout that time, he was an active champion of American leadership in space. And if that wasn't enough, he spent six more days in space than most of you here, <laughs> having served as payload specialist on STS-61 shuttle mission in 1986. Now he's in his third year serving as the 14th administrator of NASA. It is my distinct privilege privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the afternoon, the Honorable Bill Nelson. We're all here for the same reason. We're all space aficionados. We want to expand humanity's reach Technologies are being transformed in front of our eyes. Barriers are being broken. And I have the privilege of uh, trying to offer some modicum of uh, leadership to a group uh, that I refer to as a group of wizards. And they make the impossible possible. And you see that, and you've seen it over the years, but you're seeing it in extra fast time right now. We've got a hundred things going on at once in this organization. It's just amazing. But I want to take you back, and I want to trace how we got here, which is important. Because what they did now, six decades ago, was unbelievable. The Soviets had surprised us. It was uh, the first satellite. And suddenly, we felt vulnerable. And so uh, that uh, rocket uh, that we first tried to get up a 
a little satellite called Explorer. It kept exploding on the path. That was the Navy Vanguard. So they came here to Huntsville, to the Redstone Arsenal, and they said, uh, can you get one up? And thus it began. So we got Explorer up. And then uh, come uh, 1961, we got another big surprise because they had taken that Redstone rocket and it didn't have enough throw weight in terms of ICBMs. Uh, didn't have enough throw weight to get the Mercury capsule into orbit. So we were just going into low Earth orbit, just touch it and come back in a sub-orbit. And so, uh, we're getting ready to, uh, to launch Alan Shepard, and wham, we get another big surprise. And that is that the Soviets surprise us again, and they've got the high ground, and they put up Gargarin for one orbit. And then we get up. Uh, Alan Shepard for suborbit. They then put up German Titov for 10 orbits. And we're struggling. Poor Gus Grissom splashes down in the Atlantic and has to swim for it as his capsule uh, sinks. So one day I'm on the floor of the House of Representatives and the Speaker... Tip O'Neill from Boston beckons me over. He said, Billy, come here. And he says, uh, I want to tell you about an experience I had when I was a young congressman. I was down at the White House, and Kennedy was the president. And he said, I'd never seen Kennedy so nervous. He was just pacing back and forth like a cat on a hot tin roof. And... I called over to the aides and said, what's wrong with the president? And they explained that we were getting ready to put up Alan Shepard and all of the desires, the dreams of America were riding on that after the Soviets had already beat us. Now, what we did not know, because the Soviet Union was a closed society, a dictatorship, uh, and they didn't let out things. Gargarin and Titov did not land. They did not have the capability of landing that spacecraft. But of course, that was considered a part of what was a successful space flight. But we didn't know that. They bailed out. But nevertheless... America was behind, and we're trying to gain the high ground. President Kennedy made a bold decision in April of 1961. He had just been inaugurated in January, and Alan Shepard had flown. And so Kennedy goes to a joint session of the Congress, and he says, we are going to the moon and return a man safely by the end of the decade. Interestingly, it didn't get a lot of national support. But then come the next February, and John Glenn shimmies into that little Mercury spacecraft on top of an Atlas ICBM that had a 20% chance of failure. And Glenn, on an expected uh, seven orbits, they get an indication that his heat shield is loose. They decide to bring him back after three orbits. They leave the retro pack strapped to the bottom of the heat shield, and it worked. And we're off and running. 
So President Kennedy makes a decision that he is going to Houston and he's going to give a speech to a stadium full of space folks at Rice Stadium. And he says, and by the way, the Kennedy family has, have told me that his second most famous speech is this speech. The first most famous is his inaugural. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, students. <laughs> and I mean that in the sense of studying your history. Because <laughs> the fact that you all are here shows where your head is to help your, to help your country. And he says, uh, in, in the second most important speech, according to the Kennedy family, is the one that he delivered that day in Rice Stadium. And he says, we go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Space is hard. And the challenges keep coming as we continue to press outward. So, on the 60th anniversary of that speech, Rice University decides that they want NASA to come back and want to create, recreate something of that atmosphere. And they ask me to be that speaker. And so, I want you to get a glimpse of that in the overlay of what happened at NASA in 2022. Roll the tape. The short one. Throughout America's story, there are defining days, days when minds change, hearts fill, and imaginations soar. Days when visions transform the trajectory of the American story, which is our story. Doing what is hard and achieving what is great, that is what stirs humankind. That's what unites us. With inspiration and innovation, no Herculean effort is too large. No moonshot is beyond our reach. And liftoff of Artemis One. A new generation, the Artemis generation, stands ready. Ready to return humanity to the moon and then to take us further than ever before to Mars. Let us continue the quest to unfold this universe. And let us continue to find unity in our discovery. So together, let us continue to dream the impossible dream that now becomes real. Then let us traverse the untouched terrain of the once unreachable stars. So, so I think that's a, a summary of what we do that says that space is the place. And every young person knows that. And of course, uh, last year was one for the history books. What we did was hard and what we achieved was great. You think about it, Artemis One, DART. It's an acronym and it's got some long name that I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> But what it was that seven million miles from planet Earth, we had a spacecraft, it's about this high, that wide, that deep, and it's headed 
at an asteroid at 14,000 miles an hour, and it hits a bullseye. And we wanted to see if we could move it. And the way we measured it was that it was orbiting around a larger asteroid. And this small asteroid was a football stadium wide. And then we measured with our telescopes, did we move its orbit? And we did. Now we know if we've got a killer asteroid and it's headed our way, we don't want to be like the dinosaurs <laughs> millions of years ago. That was a pretty big one. That was about six miles wide. It hit in the area of the Yucatan Peninsula, it stirred up so much dust, it killed all the vegetation on the planet. The dinosaurs were history. So we wanted to see if we could hit it so that if we can find a killer asteroid early enough, far enough away that we can hit it, just nudge its trajectory. So by the time it got to us, that it'd miss us. Think about the James Webb Telescope. My goodness gracious. It is helping us understand better who we are and where we are and what we are. James Webb Telescope has captured light, travels at 186,000 miles per second, and that light that we have captured has been traveling for 13 and a half billion years. That's telling you in the formation of those first galaxies after the very beginning, which was 13.8 billion years. That tells you that it's a pretty big place out there. Pretty big place to go and explore. And so the task before us is now to keep NASA going forward and upward at the forefront of innovation and technology. And the 21st century, particularly this last decade, has been a transformation of expansion in space activities. And what's happening is as we do this, we are reigniting people's curiosity and imagination. And it's not just here at home. It's around the world. Space agencies around the world are clamoring for us to come and visit them. And they are reigniting their own people's curiosity and imagination. And you just heard with Lisa, two companies who, by the way, we're counting on to be landing on the moon. We can get the astronauts to the moon. Thanks to Marshall, we've got that capability. Now we're counting on you all to give us two landers that will get us there. But not just these big boys, Little ones are rapidly growing in the space economy, and it's no wonder then that we expect the space economy to be $1 trillion in annual revenue by 2040. So space has never been as active as it is today. And the work we do today will shape our generation and the ones to come. So let's think about Artemis, something that Marshall is particularly, that history is being made here in Huntsville once again. It was the Marshall scientists and engineers who helped design, build, and test the Saturn V rocket that carried the pioneers to the moon. And obviously, throughout human history, the moon holds a particularly, particular fascination for us earthlings. They've gazed up at the moon and they wonder. And so now, that moon has become to the forefront of our culture 
as well as our consciousness. And it's galvanized this historic effort that we are now the stewards of. And so when the Artemis II crew climbs on that rocket next year, at the end of the year, three Americans and one Canadian, the space launch system, that mega moon rocket, we're returning humanity to the moon, and the first woman and the next man on Artemis III will walk on the moon. Now, it's been a long time coming since the NASA Authorization Act of 2010. Yours truly and Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson, a Republican that I had a wonderful working relationship with, we passed, we wrote it, and we passed it, and we passed it unanimously in the Senate. And on the last day, the leaders in the House gave us a chance, but we had to put it on suspension calendar, which meant you couldn't just get a majority vote. You had to get a two-thirds vote. And that evening at 11 o'clock, before the Congress adjourned, uh, we had a three-quarters vote in the House. And that new law directed NASA to start what you are now seeing in action, a dual track of commercial and government space development. Then, former Administrator Charlie Bolden, oversaw it, continued under successive different political administrations under Jim Bridenstine. And it's a new era of cooperation between government and industry, and that is obvious in this room today. So where we go in the cosmos is important and it's important who we go with. Gone are the days when only one nation is exploring alone. And as President Biden so often says, America leads not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. And NASA is proof of that. We inspire the world, and it begins cooperation with international partners in space, both long-standing partners and new ones. Three years ago, eight nations became the first to sign the Artemis Accords. In doing so, we set out a group of common sense principles about being safe and peaceful in our future in space. I have visited a lot of countries overseas. A lot of those countries have now signed on and we have welcomed those officials from around the globe to join with us. And you'd be surprised on some of the signatories of the total of 29, and we've got a 30th that's coming. Uh, nations that don't ordinarily align with the U.S., and there's a reason for that. And that's what's special to NASA because discovery in space strengthens diplomacy on Earth. In this new era of discovery, we choose to do it together, and we are doing it. Just look at the International Space Station. Look at the 15 nations that are cooperating in an extraordinarily way to operate the International Space Station. A Herculean task. And it's been going on since 
the late 90s, and it's going all the way to 2030. And if we've got commercial stations on orbit by then, we're going to deorbit the International Space Station, and NASA will become a customer on a commercial space station for the purpose of space research, the purpose of training our astronauts before we send them to the moon and beyond. Now, as a part of this, we're building a mini space station that's going to be in lunar orbit called Gateway. It's an outpost because it won't be uh, having humans on there full time. It's a vital element of Artemis that will serve a, a multi-purpose outpost orbiting the moon. And it will provide essential support for long-term human return to the moon and as we prepare to go to Mars. So in this long-term presence that we have on the moon, we have a competitor. And the competitor has made great strides in space in the last decade. And this competitor says that they are going to land on the moon. And the goals that they have set for themselves on past accomplishments have been achieved. And so I think we might pay attention to this it's a competitor that is very secretive. I'll give you an example. They have launched three elements of their space station and it looks fairly successful. But each time their big booster rocket didn't reserve enough fuel to have a controlled re-entry of that booster. And each time as it was coming back into the atmosphere, the Chinese government would not tell us the trajectory. And on the second element that they put up, we thought it was going to come down in Greece. And then we thought it was going to come down in Saudi Arabia. Fortunately, it came down in the Indian Ocean. We have unusual cooperation with the exception of China. I have talked to the Chinese minister, uh, Chinese um, ambassador, about a couple of years ago, and I told him exactly what I've been telling you. And he said, what can we do? I said, well, let me give you an example. You have returned a sample from the moon. We returned samples 50 years ago, and we made it available to the international uh, public. You can do the same. That was two years ago. They have just now announced that they are going to make it available internationally. So I'm willing to talk, but I want you all to know we're in a space race. With industry, with the government, we are working to build a long-standing history of Mars exploration, pushing boundaries on robotic exploration of the red planet. Now we are trying to figure out, we've got about 50 samples up there of cores in that dry lake bed that's about that long, sealed up in titanium tubes about the size of a cigar. About 50 of them, 30 of them. Uh, upwards, eventually 40 in the rover. By the, ro by the way, the rover is as big as a truck. Perseverance. And 10 of them placed strategically on the surface of that dry lake bed. We are trying in this coming budget to figure out what's a way, given the constraints that the Congress is putting on us in funding. And by the way, I don't bemoan the Congress. I don't say that sarcastically at all. 
we were at a position because of some folks that had extreme ideas that we were about to go in default the full faith and credit of the United States government. And the bipartisan compromise, overwhelmingly bipartisan, the compromise was you can't spend on what you were asking for 24. You have to go back and spend at best what you were spending in 23. That presents a challenge when you're doing a hundred things at once. Together, we're unlocking the secrets of the universe with the James Webb Space Telescope. And so it's the power of space. It unites people. It unites people because people want to explore, to discover, to dream. And so let's continue on that journey together. So where are we going? The journey of that trajectory is the one that we forge today here in Huntsville and throughout America and also with our international par partners. For example, nuclear propulsion is very important. It's critical to our goal of landing humans on Mars. Now, this is not a new idea to NASA. More than 50 years ago, the U.S. conducted its last nuclear thermal engine test under NASA's nuclear engine for rocket vehicle application and rover. And here's what we learned. Conventional chemical propulsion is not the most efficient way for our astronauts to go on a deep space mission. But nuclear thermal propulsion is much more powerful with two to five times the efficiency of chemical propulsion and nuclear electric propulsion is even faster. And with the help of these new propulsion systems, of which Marshall has a major part, astronauts will be able to journey to and from deep space faster than ever. And we still don't have all the answers, but we're going to get them. But throughout the history of NASA, this agency gets the very best out of everyone, every time. If you need proof, I want you to see what 65 years of NASA have done. Roll the tape. 65 years ago, the president signed a historic piece of legislation. It stated that the United States space activities should be peaceful and that they should be done for the benefit of humanity. It created what we know today as NASA. And so this year, we celebrate the anniversary of a storied agency an agency recognized by its iconic logo, an agency that is revered around the world. America is defined by possibilities. We have always been a nation that is restless, pressing into the unknown. For the past 65 years, NASA has responded to America's clarion call the story of NASA is the story of technologies transformed, of barriers broken, of making the impossible possible. Just think of it. Apollo, Space Shuttle, Viking, Voyager, Cassini, Landsat, Galileo, Hubble, Webb, Commercial Crew, Space Station, Perseverance, 
Artemis. Nothing has symbolized the character of the American people as explorers, as discoverers, as adventurers, like NASA. Together, we are writing NASA's next chapter. We are going back to the moon and then on to Mars. We are even changing the way we fly in the air. We are developing game-changing technologies and conducting life-saving research. We're using our unique vantage point of space to protect our home planet. Every member of the NASA family, including our commercial and international partners, every member today is essential to NASA's success tomorrow. An entire generation, a new generation, is standing on the threshold, eager to move ahead and ready to stand on our shoulders. That generation is the Artemis generation. It's a new era of pioneers and star sailors, thinkers and adventurers. And when those star sailors sail on that cosmic sea to those far off cosmic shores, our missions will continue to prove once again that NASA does big things. It's the things that inspire us. It's the things that unite us. We chase the impossible dream and we reach for the unreachable stars. The first students, the, the, the first astronauts that walk on Mars are in the classrooms of America today. They are the adventurers that will take us to new horizons. And when you go in that classroom and talk to them, you ought to see how their eyes light up. And it's moments like these that occur daily and occur daily in NASA. It's what we dream and what we dare to achieve. It's what we build today and prepare to build tomorrow. It's because of the NASA family and our partners. NASA is beaming inspiration across America and throughout the world. And as President Kennedy said, a sailor who often talked in nautical terms our star sailors will sail on that cosmic sea to far off cosmic shores. The dream continues and it is alive. Y'all have a great symposium. <laughs>